All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's virtual presentation, Cooking with Uncommon Grains. Um, feel free to put any questions into the chat feature for those of you uh, logged in um, at any time throughout the program, or you can unmute yourself and verbally ask questions um, at the end when Rachel will take some questions. For those of you connecting by phone, um, I will unmute you at the end of the program. So if you do have a question, you can verbally ask a question at the end as well. Otherwise, we'll keep participants muted throughout the program just to kind of cut down on some background noise. Um, also, a follow-up email will be sent out after today's program with a link to the recording of today's program, a copy of the PowerPoint slides, and also a class evaluation. So now with that, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter today, Rachel Eckel, a registered dietitian with Pro, Pro Healthcare. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you for everyone um, who is able to join us um, for our topic this morning of cooking with uncommon grains. Um, I think this is a, maybe a little bit of a follow-up from a class we had, I think it was last month or two months ago, with unfamiliar foods. Um, so um, hopefully some of these items, if you're not familiar with them, um, or some of these grains, if you're not familiar with them, you, be, you can become a little bit more familiar with them. And um, they have some resources and ways that these foods can be incorporated um, in your uh, eating patterns. Um, so I'd first just like to start off to define what is a whole grain. I feel like this is a question um, that comes up fairly often is what actually is a whole grain when we say those words. Um, and I think even taking a step back before we even define a whole grain is, what is a grain? And a grain is actually the harvest, harvested seed from a plant's grass. And I think that that definition is not usually what we think about when we think of a grain. And I think a lot of our images might be more of kind of this hard piece that's coming off of somewhere from a plant, but it's actually the seed for the plant's grass. So that grain, that seed was blown away, it actually will start to help to germinate and to produce another of that same plant. And that's what you're consuming when you are consuming a grain. There are three main parts when we look and talk about a grain. And there's that, uh, that, that visual on the right-hand side from the Whole Grains Council. It, I think that's a really nice job of giving you the visual when we speak about a grain and a whole grain, what we're actually talking about. There are three main parts that would need to be present for a whole grain to be called a whole grain. And that includes the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. The bran is the outer hard coating um, that we find on the seed that really protects it from nature. You know, so if little animals are <laughs> trying to bite into this seed, it's going to be harder for them to do that because they have to pierce through and break through that bran. The bran is where the majority of the fiber is going to be found. Um, and that brand, because it is a little bit harder, again, there's some of that protection, is why often we get that more characteristic texture of whole grain products, um, maybe having a little bit more mouthfeel to them or a little bit more texture. They might take longer to cook. And that's because we need to break down or soften that outer hard coating, which again is the brand. Um, the endosperm is the characteristic fluffy white stuff that we might um, associate maybe with like white bread, right? That's that fluffy, soft texture that we get from um, those type of products is predominantly associated with the endosperm. This is where the, the main source of starch is found in the grain itself. At the bottom of that visual then, we see that yellow section that's labeled the germ. And the germ is going to be a very nutrient-dense part to a grain or to that seed 
where if that seed were to start to germinate, this is the nutrition for that grain to now sprout and become its own independent plant. So we tend to see that there's really high amounts of um, fats, so a high energy source for this plant to grow, and also tends to be a high source of B vitamins too. So it's the nutrition for that grain or that seed to grow, should it be germinated or should it be planted um, to have another plant be grown from it. So we talk about a whole grain, again, that whole harvested seed. We are talking about all three parts being present. Where fine grains often strip away the bran and the germ and leave us predominantly with the endosperm to be left. Um, you can buy the germ specifically, especially like in wheat. So if you've ever heard of wheat germ, um, the glass jar with the red top pie being the most common way you might see it, um, that is harvesting the, the very nutrient-dense components of, again, the B vitamins, and then also looking at some of the different types of fats. Uh, you, I don't know if anyone has ever heard or has tried in the past things like sprouted grains, so I'm just going to take a quick detour to mention those. Um, sprouted grains are often the whole grain that is present. Um, just because that grain is a seed, once it starts to sprout, that's when we're really harvesting this, this seed, this grain, then to be utilized. So sprouted grain breads, for example, has been a um, more recent, um, has had a more recent emergence on the market. We tend to see that sprouted grains are very high in B vitamins. Again, that's the nutrients that are really going to help that grain grow um, if it were to uh, uh, mature into a full plant. So why are whole grains important? Why do we have so much focus on having these whole grains be present in our eating patterns? Um, we notice that there are actually some significant differences in nutrients that are provided in whole grains versus the refined grain, or again, the grains where the bran and the germ has been separated from the entire package. And four nutrients that I want to point out in particular are fiber, manganese, um, copper, and phosphorus. I think we might be most familiar with the first one and the last one perhaps, with fiber um, and with uh, phosphorus, um, even if they're familiar just by the names. Um, fiber we know can assist with digestive uh, benefits, regularity, scrubbing out your intestinal walls, Manganese is going to be an essential nutrient when we look at bone formation along with other things like our connective tissues. Um, so as our bones are building up and are recycling themselves throughout the lifespan, manganese is going to be one of those nutrients that plays a key role with that. Copper helps to support your red blood cells in both formation and also with the health of your red blood cells along with your nerves. And we again tend to see that copper uh, presence is much higher in our whole grains as compared to our refined grains. Phosphorus is actually one of the most predominant nutrients that you find stored in your bones and in the body. Um, next to calcium, phosphorus is right up there when we look at uh, bone health. We also know that phosphorus plays a role in the, the energy production process. So when you eat food, phosphorus is then involved in creating energy from the, from the food that you have consumed. Um, in those cycles. And these, are, again, are going to be some of the nutrients that are more predominant in whole grains, not added into the whole grain or added into the grain. They are naturally present in these items. We also see correlations with positive uh, cardiovascular results. Um, we know that some of the fiber that's present in those whole grains can really assist with reduction of LDL cholesterol, which we often call the bad cholesterol or lousy cholesterol, the cholesterol we want to see lower. It can assist with triglyceride levels as well and reduction of those numbers. And we can also see benefit at postprandial or after meal glucose readings when, uh, when whole grains compared to refined grains would be used. 
The grains that we will speak about today are, are listed on the screen ahead of you, um, and we're just going to work right down the line. Starting first with amaranth. Amaranth is a, again, we'll use the word grain, is a grain that's actually considered to be a pseudo grain or pseudo cereal. And what that means is that it is consumed as a grain, but it is not coming from a grass source. So we defined grains earlier as um, the harvested seed from a plant's grass. A pseudo grain or a pseudo cereal is not coming from the grass, but it is actually coming from another source, but it is consumed as a grain. And amaranth is going to be in that group. Amaranth, as you can see in that picture, is a really tiny, uh, a tiny grain. Um, it's very fine. It almost, to me, kind of looks um, or resembles like millet or quinoa, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Amaranth is a complete protein, which means it gives your body all the building blocks that it needs um, in order to build and to support muscle and other structures within your body. Amaranth's flavor profile tends to be a little peppery and a little bit sweet. And to me, those almost sound like they should be um, opposites if something's peppery but having some underlying tones of sweetness. But with that, that means that it pairs well with savory flavors and also with sweet flavors. So for example, with sweet flavors, that might mean it could be used as or a part of or mixed with like oatmeal in the morning and you can add cinnamon to it or you could add apple pie spice or pumpkin pie spices to them because it pairs well with those sweet undertones that amaranth is going to be providing. I think the, the, the tricky part with some of these different grains is their measurements aren't all the same. <laughs> they need different dry ingredient or dried grain to liquid proportions. They also cook for different amounts of times and they yield different amounts. Um, so when we are going to look at how much do I get out of making a certain amount, these are going to be your ratios. So for amaranth, it's a cup dry to two cups of liquid, boiling and then simmering for about 15 to 20 minutes. The nice thing is because amaranth is such a small uh, piece, <laughs> such a small unit, um, we do tend to see a little bit shorter cook times versus some of the other grains we'll talk about today are bigger pieces that's usually requiring a longer cook time. The yield is about two and a half times the dry amount. So about a cup dry amaranth would equate to about two and a half cups cooked. For a little bit of the nutritional breakdown of amaranth, a quarter cup uncooked um, will give you about, so that again gives us maybe about two thirds cup cooked, that gives us about 32 grams of carb, four to five grams of fiber, and about seven grams of protein. Where I have brought up and have um, oops, uh, just to show some recipes, the main sources that I am going to pull from, and let me just, I think I'll have to flip my screen, my screen over for sharing, I believe. Let me see if I can get that. Do you see the screen that shows an amaranth picture now? Okay. Um, so uh, where I'm going to pull a couple of wonderful resources and recipes for, for these whole grains is from two primary sources. The first one is going to be where a few initial recipes are coming from, and that is the Whole Grain Council. Um, they are a national organization based on the East Coast. I'll reference that again at the end, too. Um, but looking at, again, kind of that flavor, that flavor profile, um, again, kind of that pepperiness. So this example of a recipe pulls in the grain, um, the amaranth grain, but pulls in things like peppers, a little bit of a, a, a spicy or pe uh, 
uh, spicy type pepper with pobano, which is usually a milder one, um, and cabbage. So it works really well as a side dish. I also mentioned that it works really well in um, kind of like a, almost like a porridge, but almost like in an oatmeal consistency too, where the sweetness can be added when we look at things like adding cinnamon or vanilla or some of those other flavor profiles. Um, our next grain is going to be barley. I guess that might be slightly more familiar to you. Um, I feel like we may talk about barley a little bit more often than some other ones, especially as we come into perhaps some of the, uh, the winter months um, when we look at things like you know, barley-based soups, beef and barley-based soups. Um, but barley is going to be an excellent source of a type of fiber called beta glute uh, beta glutan, excuse me, um, and that is a soluble fiber that works really well with reduction of LDL cholesterol and when we look at cardiovascular, um, generally cardiovascular health. Barley, the flavor profile is a little bit chewier, um, which means it's a little bit more mouthfeel to it. You're going to have to chew it a few more times versus example compared to amaranth, it's likely to go a little bit quicker. The flavor profile of barley, as I was just mentioning, is that it pairs really well with fall and winter flavors. So the time when we're coming into things like stews, uh, stews or soups it works beautifully with. So this may also include things like pairing it with sweet potatoes, perhaps, pairing it with some meats um, as well is a really nice flavor combination um, that barley will provide. The preparation of it is one cup dry to three cups liquid. So this one does need a little bit higher of a volume amount of water. Because that grain is a little bit bigger, again, maybe compared to amaranth, um, we do see a longer cook time with it. And usually then we also need a higher liquid or water volume with it as well. You tend to get about three and a half times the dry amount out for your yield. Um, so it, it, a cup does produce quite a bit. And that's something to take into consideration as well when you're preparing the grains. Um, making sure your container or your, your um, pot is going to be large enough to contain what that end yield would be producing. Um, one of the recipes that I have linked, and Laura, since it's a little bit cumbersome, I think for me time to jump back and forth, what I can do is I can send all those recipes out um, after the presentation to you and have them all set versus trying to jump back and forth. So I realize I'm a little bit more cumbersome on, with doing that right now. Um, but the salad that I had um, pulled up is a barley banana jicama um, a salad with avocado. So it's a little bit more of a cooler dish, a cooler side dish, um, but it's just another way that we can kind of pull in some of those other flavor and flavor profiles that might not be as common to place together. Um, just to mention for anyone on the call today um, who is kind of thinking through perhaps uh, grains that might be gluten free or not, barley is one of ours that does contain gluten. Um, when we look at amaranth, that is a gluten free grain. Okay. Um, the next one that I want to speak on is bulgur. Um, we often know bulgur just by its name bulgur, but it's actually also known as cracked wheat. And the reason why we look at it as being cracked wheat um, is because the process of bulgur getting to the store for us, it is parboiled prior to you receiving it. And that is the biggest difference between crack wheat and bulgur, is that bulgur is going to be parboiled. And what that means and what that allows for in your cooking preparation is that there is going to be a quicker cook that you can do with bulgur compared to cracked wheat. 
Um, so if you're shorter on time, need a quicker side dish, bulgur would be a more, perhaps a more appropriate choice compared to cracked wheat. The profile of bulgur is a nutty flavor, and you can actually pop it like popcorn. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that before, but you can pop it almost like popcorn, um, and it has that very popcorn-y smell um, when you do that. You can just put it in a pan, heat it up, maybe a little bit of oil in the pan to prevent any sort of um, burning that could happen, and it just kind of starts sprouting up. Usually the pieces and the kernels will be a bit smaller than, than what popcorn um, would yield, but that is another use that you can use for bulgur. When we look at the preparation of it, it's going to be about one cup dry to about two cups liquid and boiling for about that 15 minutes. Something to be aware of though with bulgur is you can buy it in multiple different coarseness. And the more coarse the variety, the longer it would take to prepare or to simmer um, after the boil, and you may need more liquid present. The finer the bulgur, the less time is used in preparation, and also we see that you often would need less liquid present. And it all comes down to the surface area of it. Um, if it is a thicker grain, it just takes longer for the water to break that down and have it be soft enough in order for appropriate or, or, or usable um, uh, mastication and chewing of it um, versus if it's a, a finer product that does seem to cook much quicker. So just being aware of those differences um, between bulgur um, and different coarseness. When we look at the nutrition composition of bulgur in a quarter cup cooked, we get about 26-ish grams of carb, about five to seven grams of fiber with it, and about four grams of protein. So something really nice about bulgur is that ratio of carbohydrate to fiber is kind of in one of our, our, our ideal ranges that we want to see. When I talk about an ideal range of that carbohydrate to fiber content, especially with our whole grains, about a five to one ratio is kind of the sweet point. And what that means is that for every five grams of carbohydrate, if there's one gram of fiber that's present, we tend to see some of the best postprandial results um, or after meal results and glucose responses. Um, and that ratio is, uh, that one to five ratio is more highly preferred than having it be a, a more expanded type of ratio. Bulgur is one, as it's known as cracked wheat, and that is not gluten-free. This would be a gluten-containing product. I can't see everyone in my little screen on the side, but farro, or you want to use the voting part, who has used farro before? I feel like this is maybe a more common one that people have, have come across in the past couple of years, and it's, I think, really hit the market quite a bit more than many of our others. Um, farro is also known as emmer, so that's two names for basically the exact same type of product. One of the really nice things about farro is that it holds up really well to long cooking times. So I don't know if anyone has ever paired a grain and it just disintegrates because it was in the slow cooker for uh, two or three hours or longer and it just kind of falls apart and breaks apart. Farro is one that is very unlikely to do that. It tends to have good durability to it. And with that durability, that's why we tend to see a little bit more of a chewy texture. Um, again, when we say chewy texture, it's a little bit more melt feel to it when you are consuming it. It does tend to have a little bit more of a nutty taste to it, as we, you've heard be mentioned before too, um, that that kind of nutty flavor profile is very common with many of our whole grains. When we look at the nutrition composition of farro, a quarter cup uncooked is about 30 to 35 grams of carb, about three grams of fiber, and about seven grams of protein. 
The preparation method for farro is about one cup dry to about three cups of liquid. So this one does um, require a little bit higher of a dry to liquid ratio. And usually simmering after the boil for about 30 minutes tends to be adequate. Again, because it can hold up to long cooking, um, cooking times, it is one um, that's not likely to disintegrate if you cook it for 40 minutes instead. It is going to still hold up quite well. This, uh, for farro, we get about a one to two dry to cooked ratio in terms of the yield amount. Farro can also be used often as a, uh, a little hardier um, replacement for rice. So it's one that can be you know, used, for example, in like stir fries or if you're making um, stuffed peppers. It's a really nice addition in both of those areas. Uh, just to give a little, again, a little bit more of that hardiness that we tend to find in farro compared to some of our other grains. Farro is one, uh, a grain as well, that will contain gluten. Millet, I feel like, is one that is very similar in look to what amaranth looks like, that we had seen that picture at the beginning. It's kind of a small little bowl um, in terms of what that seed looks like. Interestingly, though, millet refers to a group of small seeds. So it's not always a distinct, this is millet, but there are many different types of millet. Teff, if you have uh, heard of teff before, is actually a type of millet. Millet is known for its wonderful antioxidant profile. And antioxidants, are going to be the shields that protect your cells. So when we consume antioxidants, just picture little, little shields going around your cells. And as things come to damage your cells, it damages the antioxidant. The antioxidant takes that hit and your cells then are protected. Other antioxidants include things like vitamin C. So we think of things like red peppers and strawberries and a lot of our citrus fruit, those would be our antioxidants, along with vitamin E. Vitamin C and vitamin E are also some of our strong antioxidants as well. Um, since millet is a group, referring to this group of seeds, nutrient differences will be found depending on the exact type of millet that is being used or consumed. But generally, it still has that good source of fiber, proteins, and phosphorus. A quarter cup uncooked of millet contains about 30 to 35 grams of carbohydrate, 4 grams of fiber, and about 6 grams of protein. The flavor profile of millet um, is kind of coming into the seasonal part too with winter and fall type recipes. Um, that it pairs very well with warm flavors. So again, when you think of warm flavors, um, think of kind of like chili-esque type flavors. And those are what we refer to as our warm flavors. The squashes, um, the, the butternut squash, the acorn squashes, and mushrooms tend to have a very complementary flavor profile to millet. Because I had pointed out TEF earlier, um, I just want to point this one out more specifically that it actually has a more sweet profile and tends to pair really well with cinnamon and chocolate. So just kind of like with amaranth, when we said, well, that could be something that might be um, used well with mixed into, say, like oatmeal or almost like a porridge type of a breakfast option. Tough as well can be used in that similar area because of those flavor profiles are really complementary, especially with pairing with a more sweet profile of the flavors. For preparation, we see that one cup dry um, would be added to about two to two and a half cups liquid. If you are desiring a more creamy texture, um, a higher fluid content, of course, then could be used. 
Similar to others, boiling and then simmering for about 20 to 30 minutes um, tends to yield the most desirable results. And we often will get about almost three times the yield from dry. So this is one of ours, just like I think one other we had mentioned so far, where we're getting about triple the expansion um, of the product and of the grain. Of course, that will be, be dependent on the liquid ratio and exactly which type or which um, variety of millet would be utilized. Um, speaking though of it as being kind of those warm flavors and pairing well with some of those warm breakfast options, again, as we come into fall or as we're in fall and come into winter, um, the recipe that will be provided is for banana millet and walnut porridge. Um, polenta. Polenta is going to be our next grain. And we might think of this one a little bit less of a grain as more of like a grain flour, perhaps. Here in the U.S., we see it most often um, being made from corn. So another starter for polenta is corn meal, um, which is something that we may be a little bit more familiar with um, than actually uh, polenta itself. In terms of the nutrient profile, unfortunately, it's usually more of the additions that we see added to polenta, such as things like butters or cheeses, um, if it's more of that savory side of the flavor profile that you are going for, that will truly more so impact the nutrition information and the nutrition content. For the flavor profile, just as you may anticipate, is going to be kind of a creamy corn flavor. It literally is going to be ground up dry corn that then we can rehydrate um, into that, um, that thicker consistency um, versus individual pieces. Because we often go for a more creamy consistency, the dry to liquid ratio is going to be much higher than many of the other types of grains we have already referenced. The preparation, though, and cooking method for it um, is often a little bit different um, in terms of, um, kind of stirring and whisking and um, uh, adding the grain to the boiling water. So once we have the water boiling, that's when we want to add in the dry polenta while whisking it and then simmering for about 20 to 20, uh, 25 to 30 minutes, excuse me, whisking about every uh, five minutes or so. And that just helps to ensure that there's going to be no clumps and that really creamy texture that most people desire out of polenta um, is going to be achieved. Our yield amount is about one cup dry to about two and a half cups cooked. When we look at the nutrition profile of polenta, a quarter cup of essentially corn meal um, uncooked will yield about um, 25 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, about two grams of fiber, and then about three grams of protein. The recipe that will be provided um, is a classic polenta. <laughs> I feel like polenta is often one um, that you either maybe have had as an adult or as a child or may have much lower exposure to. Um, so keeping it simple with a classic polenta. Quinoa seems to be a more um, um, known type of a, uh, a seed. It is also just like amaranth considered to be one of our pseudo cereals. So again, it is not coming from a grass source, but it is a seed that is commonly then going to be used as a grain, just like amaranth is. One of the distinct parts about quinoa and um, that kind of it gets toted for is that it is a complete protein. I just saw a message popped up that my audio might be off. This, is this better? It, it kind of comes in and out like it gets better at times and then it gets a little bit worse. So. I think okay. maybe just so staying as close my... as you can 
Yeah, I'll, I'll turn it even more so maybe that will better help pick that up. Okay. Um, the, the flavor profile of quinoa, kind of back to many of the other similar ones, is nutty and chewy. Um, so you can get a little bit more of that mouthfeel that we tend to get from um, many of these whole grains. Nice thing with quinoa is that it is very versatile and that it can pair really well with cold and warm dishes. Um, so it's one that can just go through the entire, um, uh, it can go through the entire uh, season, the entire year with you when we look at production. The nutrient profile of quinoa is going to be similar no matter if you get uh, the white quinoa, the tricolor quinoa, black quinoa, red quinoa. The nutrient profile is going to be rel uh, relatively similar across the board. A quarter cup uncooked quinoa, um, again, it's going to give us about 25 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, about 3 to 5 grams of fiber, and 7 grams of protein. One thing to be well aware of with quinoa is that there is a very, um, a very distinguished flavor if it is not rinsed ahead of time. Um, just like we mentioned at the beginning, that that outer hard shell that we find with many of our whole grains is to protect the bran, is to protect the insides and allowing that grain or that seed to germinate. Quinoa has a very characteristic bitter taste to it that should act as a deterrent um, for animals to eat it up. If you do not rinse your quinoa ahead of time, that bitter taste can still be present um, after cooking. And that's usually the flavor that more people pick up on um, if you may be less familiar with uh, preparing quinoa. So give your quinoa a rinse ahead of time. Um, I would not recommend putting it into a colander. It's going to fall straight through. But if you happen to have, say, a, um, a cheesecloth, maybe putting um, it through a cheesecloth, put the quinoa in a pan, um, pour water in there, rinse it, carefully use your lid perhaps to drain the water out. But we do want to give quinoa a good rinse prior to even starting to cook it. Preparation of quinoa is about one cup dry to about two cups of liquid, um, boiling and then simmering for up to about 15 minutes. Quinoa probably is most closely um, in preparation um, associated with how rice is made, even in terms of that timing. You tend to get about a one to three ratio for yield, um, so about one cup dry to about three cups cooked um, is what you can expect from it. I tend to find that the tricolor quinoa sometimes has a little bit sweeter t overall taste profile versus the, uh, um, the standard kind of white quinoa. Um, not everyone picks up on that, but it does seem to have a slightly sweeter, uh, sweeter flavor profile to it. Since quinoa can work really well across the spectrum throughout the whole year, there will be two recipes provided, um, one that's winter-based, um, pulling in some of um, some fennel and some really nice spices to it, and then also, again, going towards the more hot side when we look at a breakfast quinoa that will pull in a couple of different grains with it as well. The other um, grain that you want to speak on is spelt. Um, and spelt uh, is probably a, a lesser known type of grain compared to maybe some of the other ones that we have, um, that we have already spoken on. Spelt, it contains a good amount of soluble fiber. I know that that has come up a couple of times already, but with spelt, what we see um, is that, again, it, it characteristically comes as a whole grain where that soluble fiber has not been extracted from the grain already. Again, pre pre uh, predominantly looking at the cardiovascular benefits um, that we find from it, um, and then also those postprandial and after um, after eating, glucose responses tends to be more favorable when soluble fiber is present. 
Um, to me, I feel like spelt visually looks more like a what we might consider to be a seed and or a grain <laughs> itself. Um, and so uh, spelt also I think kind of looks a little bit like um, corn almost in, in what its size is too. So slightly a bigger, uh, a slightly bigger grain um, compared to some of the other grains that we have spoken on. When we look at the flavor profile of spelt, it does have that slight sweet undertone to it. And we're not, and we say sweet, we're not mentioning sweet as um, it's going to taste like a dessert, but there are those undertones of sweetness versus those undertones of the savoriness. And as we find with many of these whole grains, it does tend to have a bit of a nuttier flavor profile to it um, compared to um, like an, an overly earthy type feel. It's more of a nutty flavor profile. When we look at the preparation of spelt, this one does take quite a bit of liquid to dry ratio. We had mentioned earlier that typically the bigger the grain, um, that we might need more liquid to assist with that softening um, prior to cooking it. I have a range of about four to six cups liquid. It is really going to though depend on um, how soft you want your end product to come up on. So you may need to drain some of that liquid off um, after you have gone through the process of cooking it. Boiling, then adding the spelt berries, which are the spelt grains, returning to a gentle boil, but leaving this one uncovered. Um, that does seem to yield some of the better results when we do look at spelt and spelt uh, preparation. Spelt is going to give us a yield about um, three times compared to the dry amount, the dry volume, in terms of the amount you can expect to get out from it. The spelt recipe that you'll be receiving um, is a roasted butternut squash um, with spelt dish. Um, so again, kind of those nutty, those warm flavors is very characteristic of spelt and very characteristic of um, many of these whole grains. Where again, those nutty, those warm flavors tend to be um, kind of a repeat, a, a, a repeat theme across the whole board of whole grains. Some of the grains that we mentioned today, you can get in other sources. So we're talking about it as the whole grain itself, you know, buying quinoa by itself, buying, or as the whole grain. Um, spelt, um, we had mentioned top earlier with millet. You can also buy some of these as the, um, uh, as the flour versions of it too. And the nutrients are going to be very similar um, between the two in terms of fiber content and protein content. And technically then, those flours are likely or should still be considered a whole grain flour. So when we say that word whole grain, we are looking at the bigger category of uh, uh, of all the grains possible, and then we can narrow it down to whole spelt, whole millet, whole pep as the individual grain itself. But again, if you were to use it in the flour form in terms of maybe things like baking products, um, you know, muffins or cookies or things like that, the nutrient profile will well, will well represent that of the whole grain itself. Since I didn't pull up all the recipes, I did cut off some time. I was expecting to walk through some of those. So we will, I will send those over to Laura so that each of those can be provided and you will have hard copies of them um, so that you would not have to just access them online. But with that, I guess I would um, I guess like to open up if there are any questions regarding these grains um, preparation or cooking with any of the grains that we have talked about today. So you can either type questions into the chat box or uh, at this point you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question out loud. I have a question. 
on the recipes, um, you have bananas, and I'm allergic to bananas. Would you have any suggestions on what I could use? Yeah, and, and so I believe that, let me go back, I believe that was the jicama one, correct, with jicama, there we go, the barley banana jicama. Um, I feel like a nice flavor profile too potentially could be like some berries with it, strawberries might pair well with that, strawberries pair, tend to pair really well with jicama, um, and with barley, so I might actually suggest going towards that, or even maybe apples. Um, if apples uh, would be an okay item for you too, maybe between apples and berries, those might be some nice substitutions. All right, so I saw, I saw a question pop up in the corner too. Um, so in terms of gluten, it already disappeared, but I think um, polenta was one of them. Polenta being based off of corn does not contain gluten. Quinoa um, as well does not contain gluten. Belt does contain gluten. I think there was one more and I didn't catch. Yep. So the question um, was, which one it was. Yeah, the question does uh, is does millet, quinoa, spelt, and polenta have gluten? So millet is gluten free, polenta is gluten free, quinoa is gluten free, um, spelt is not gluten free. Spelt would contain gluten. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for joining us today. Just as a reminder, I will send out a follow up email. Um, I know there were a couple issues with some audio. Hopefully, maybe the audio in the recording might be okay. Um, so I will send a, a follow-up email with the link to the recording as well as the recipes and the PowerPoint slides from Rachel and a uh, class evaluation. So thank you so much for joining us today and have a good rest of your day.